Um, well, it's a delight uh, this afternoon to be able to speak with you uh, about something that I think is very much something that I think I've encountered a lot in my life is people who find themselves put off uh, by religion, uh, by organized religion, as sometimes people put it, or by the church uh, that, you know, people, if, if the church, you know, they don't know much about the church, but they know something about Galileo, the Inquisition, and the Crusades. I used to have a friend who called it the CIG history. That's all they know. Um, but, uh, and somehow the church is awful in these elements and uh, probably not true and not complex, but, but it is a way in which, you know, the human side of the church, I sometimes, I don't need big things like that. I can just find, you know, like parking is enough to annoy me, um, you know, or uh, again, you know, a church's policy about, you know, wearing masks enough to get my ire up. I don't need big problems. Um, but in a way, it's like this face of the church that kind of seems annoying. Uh, it seems maybe arbitrary. Uh, how do we somehow learn to recognize that in that is somehow where God is coming to meet me? Uh, the short answer for today is that we want to not be spiritual but not religious, but become spiritual and religious. And we have to rediscover the virtue of religion. And before we get into the specifics, I want to highlight in a way, we have to also recognize, um, right, you know, the, the atheist is never wholly wrong. Aristotle will say that no opinion is so wrong that it doesn't have an element of truth to it, right? There is something about the world that is a mess. Uh, and there's something about the church that's a mess. Um, there's something about the 12 apostles that are kind of scandalous that one of them betrayed Jesus and one of them denied Jesus. Why would I want to follow a Jesus who had such apostles or listen to such apostles? Right. Um, there's a profound mystery at the heart of the Christian faith, which is that human beings are both the receptacle of divine revelation, the means of communicating divine revelation, and the divine revelation is that we are utterly incapable of either generating or on our own even communicating divine revelation properly, right? It's the mystery of grace. So we really do want to then pay attention to a certain sense in which spirituality and religion are renewed. They are rebirthed in Christ. Okay, so I want to highlight four different spiritual but not religious mentalities. Uh, and the first one is what I call the Burger King way, right? Have it your way. Uh, I was on an article, by the way, I was doing a little work on this, spiritual but uh, not religious. And one of the things that somebody describes is that they like to think about, you know, spirituality as the Burger King way, right? Everybody gets to do it their way. Whatever works for you, sounds good. Um, interestingly, in doing a little work on this, I found out that uh, Burger King in 2014 thought this was, um, or they eventually ended up switching it to you rule. And then in 2014, they tried to come up with a different one, which is just be your way. Um, anyway, they had some marketing people from Brazil that thought this would be cooler. Uh, but it's interesting, have it your way, be your way, you rule. Uh, right, this in a way is, so to speak, somehow, it seems freeing at first. You don't have to do what other people tell you to do. Um, we, there's a strange thing, I don't know if, you've, if, if you have children or teach schools or different things like that, or just, of course, have been a human being um, with perhaps other people who tell you what to do. You know, like the first thing when anybody tells you something to do, your first thought is no, right? It just, nobody likes to be told what to do. So. In some ways, well, wouldn't it make sense that in that which is most important to us, we could just figure it out for ourselves? Um, it's kind of silly, but on the other hand, it, it's, it's maybe close, you know, we, we, we want this somehow. Uh, another approach that I read in Huffington Post, uh, just I figure a good place to find some kooky ideas, um, is she wrote this, I don't need to define myself 
to any community by putting myself in a box labeled Catholic, Baptist, or Muslim. When I die, I believe all my accounting will be done to God, and that when I enter the eternal realm, I will not walk through a door with a label on it. Um, it's an interesting line here, of course, because um, you may have that echo, I'll look at it later, on John 10, when Jesus says, I am the door, uh, which is kind of interesting, which is kind of fun, by the way. Maybe we need a door, right, uh, if we want to go somewhere. Uh, but, but there's something in this, which is also, again, I think a kind of popular idea that, you know, even if there is a God, God surely has to be greater than the human labels of God. Uh, there's that story of the elephant who comes into the room with the six wise men, and one touches the trunk and thinks he's a rope. One thinks, touches the side and thinks he's a wall. Um, one touches his ears and thinks he's a sail. One touches, um, you know, uh, the different parts of him. And kind of like this is just all religions are trying to find the elephant. Uh, and again, there's a there's an element of truth to that. There are a lot of religions in the world and a lot of them are pretty incomplete. Uh, of course, you also have to deal with the reality that there's a strange one religion who says that there's a man who says, I am the elephant, right? Well, that's a historical fact. And he says, I rose from the dead. So we got a weird elephant. The elephant came, uh, lived among us and was killed and then rose again. I also want to suggest there's something about this idea, though, that's worse than it sounds at first. Um, because although it somewhat sounds okay to say God is more than individual re human religions and philosophical traditions, in the classical world, let's just say you're a Viking, by the way, you know, the Vikings didn't think of themselves as not participating in something real. Classical spiritual traditions were, were real. People believed them. And just consider, in a way, kind of the modern individualism that separates us from one another and the chronological snobbery, as C.S. Lewis called it, that separates us from everything in the past. Everybody in the past is naive, but we somehow are the pinnacle of wisdom, right? Forgetting, of course, that other generations may look at us and think that we're naive. So when somebody has this attitude of, oh, that's just another human label for God, in a way, they're kind of cutting themselves off from everything else. So just imagine what it would have been like to have been a Viking right? and to live under this prayer, this funeral prayer. Lo there, do I see my father? Lo there, do I see my mother, my sister, my brothers? Lo there, do I see the line of my people back to the beginning? Lo, do they call me? They did me to take, they bid me to take my place among them in the hollowed halls of Valhalla, where the brave shall live forever. You can live and you can die with such a religion. It might be false, but you can live and die with it. You can organize a culture around it. You can raise children in it. You can, you can suffer with it because you believe if you suffer bravely, you will join the halls of Valhalla. If we go back, right? How do I, if I believe that God is somehow more than every religion, then in a way God is also kind of an empty thing. How do I live my life and organize my life around that? I end up being somewhat alone. Again, it sounds freeing at first, but it ends up leaving me again alone. So a third SBNR is what I would call non-spiritual, non-religious spirituality or philosophy. And this is my attempt to say, maybe there's some people who say this and they really are on a path of seeking wisdom. Uh, Owen Barfield wrote to C.S. Lewis when he was uh, a student uh, before his conversion, philosophy was not a subject to Socrates, but a way. 
The ancients didn't study philosophy in class because they wanted to be an engineering student and they had to take some humanities classes, right? They became a philosopher because they dedicated their life to wisdom. And interestingly, in the Greco-Roman world, a lot that you had, they would still practice the pagan cults of the sacrifices to the many gods, but they used philosophy to discover the true God. Plato's apology uh, of Socrates. At the very end, when Socrates is going to die, um, he's, uh, he's, yeah, he's the Athenian um, courts are basically putting him to death. Uh, he, he says, I go to die and you go to, or sorry, yeah, I go to die and you go to live. Which of us goes to the better is known only to the God, Hatheos, the God, not the gods. So philosophy in a way was a spiritual way of stepping outside of the pagan religions of the day. Uh, it's interesting that in a way Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and a few others kind of came close to a notion of the creator, the God. So much so that the fathers of the church would occasionally uh, suggest uh, that uh, Socrates had encountered Moses because they thought that was the only way that you could discover the creator. Uh, and I think we can see this again, Plato, Aristotle, Zeno, the Stoics, there's a kind of path of wisdom here that's not explicitly religious, it's philosophical, it's spiritual, it's discovering this. You can even see some of this in Confucius's Analytics, Analects, Buddhism, 12-step recovery programs, uh, you'll occasionally run into this as well. And, and in part, I would even say, if you're familiar with Boethius' The Consolation of Philosophy, he knows the consolation of Christ, but he wants to discover the consolation of philosophy. What can philosophy tell us? So if these have meaning or can help us somewhat, it's because they learn to discipline the ego and grow in virtue. We're going to see, of course, there's still not going to be enough, right? Uh, St. Uh, Augustine, in his Confessions, says that the Platonists helped him discover that God was immaterial and that his soul was immaterial. So that God was not just, as he put it before, he used to think about God as a big kind of ocean and then as a physical ocean and the earth floating in it kind of like um, a sponge. But that would, of course, mean, as he puts it, that bigger things would have more God in them, which is kind of absurd. And how do you get evil? So he had to discover things from the Platonists. But he said this. He said the Platonists could see the homeland with God, but they couldn't see the way. Because the way was the incarnation, the humility of Jesus on his incarnation and resurrection, and his uh, death on the cross. Okay, so that's just at least another way that we can consider spiritual but not religious. And a fourth way is um, Jesus is greater than religion. Um, there's this guy, Jefferson Bethke, he uh, gave, had a poem uh, that he rapped somewhat on um, YouTube. It had like six million views in 48 hours, and I think it has over 30 million views now. It's about, it's like 2014. Um, why I hate religion but love Jesus. It's kind of a good, just simple evangelical, non-denominational Protestant idea. Right. Back to the point, one thing is vital to mention, how Jesus and religion are on opposite spectrums. See, one's the work of God, but one's a man-made invention. See, one is the cure, the other's the infection. See, because religion says do, Jesus says done. Religion says slave, Jesus says son. Religious puts you in bondage while Jesus sets you free. Religion makes you blind, but Jesus makes you see. So for religion, no, I hate it. I, in fact, I literally resent it because when Jesus said it is finished, I believe he meant it. Um, anyway, you can listen to the whole thing if you want. Uh, but the basic idea here is people that do see not only the way to wisdom, but actually see Jesus, but think that Jesus frees them from all religion. Right. Jesus says, done, so therefore I don't have to do anything. 
all religious acts of worship, religious sacraments, all of these are ways of kind of confusing or taking away from the mystery of Jesus. So I think this is another element. And I think in a way, if you pay, if you're kind of like interested in the history of the development of philosophy and theology, you can kind of see in part the Reformation distrusts works. It's faith versus works, but the works that it distrusts are not fundamentally good works. They're fundamentally the works of the sacraments. It's really a rejection of the sacraments as meaningful ways of encountering Jesus. You only encounter in Jesus through the internal act of faith, not through the acts of worship, um, at least in the kind of... Uh, in its kind of purest form, as in some ways, as Luther articulates it. And I think in part, that kind of sets up the later modes of spiritual but not religious. Carl Adam, who's somebody we're going to look at here, at one time he says the basically the 16th century tries to have Christ without the church. Uh, the 17th and 18th centuries try to have God without Christ. And the 19th and 20th centuries try to have man without God. Right? It's a progressive diminution, diminution of life. And of course, he says the beauty of Catholicism, it's an affirmation of everything because you get man, God, Christ, and the church. You get it all. Okay, so if those are four different objections, how do we begin to try to think through this more clearly? And in part, when I was starting to work on this, I remember being a student at Notre Dame. I think it was like in the late 90s. Actually, one of the fun things I did while I was a graduate student at Notre Dame is I was the first person to get Scott Hahn to come speak at Notre Dame. And um, the way I did it is the theology department wouldn't support it. i sorry to say the campus ministry department wouldn't support it. Um, but I've had, I had a friend who was an engineer and he had a chair and he had money. So he was the one who brought in Scott Hahn. It was great. We packed 400 people in this room, in a big room. It was, it was and it was exciting. And also kind of the sign of sometimes my political um, uh, poor skills. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, it was the uh, beginning of a wonderful friendship. But I also remember that same year, Cardinal Orinze from Africa, who was the prefect for the Congregation of Divine Worship, or he became that a little bit afterwards, he came and he packed. We had uh, like 800 people. And I remember he was up on stage in a big auditorium and there were undergraduates sitting all around him, about 100 on stage. And I remember him saying this exact point. Religion is a normal dimension of human earthly existence. If you're not religious, you're abnormal. Right? To be human is to be religious, not just homo sapiens, but homo adorans. We are adoring people. Religion is not optional, it's not marginal, it's not additional, it's essential. A person without religion should fundamentally be pitied because that person is like a person on a journey. And when you ask him, where are you going? He says, oh, I never thought of it, right? How sad. It gives a sense of direction to our lives and a sense of meaning and synthesis of all the mosaics that make the beautiful peace that is life on earth. And again, if we think about what's happening in terms of the West, in terms of the culture, this broad pandemic of depression, anxiety, rage, suicidality, well, we don't have a sense of the direction or meaning or synthesis. There's no peace because there's no peace other than what we make. So religion is normal. And we just have to kind of get that back in our heads. John Courtney Murray wrote a book uh, called The Problem of God. And in there, these are, it's interesting, he gave those in the 40s at Yale University. They invited him as a Jesuit priest to give a lecture series at Yale Universities. Right. Those were the days. Um, and he said basically the problem of God is this. If God exists, then the most important thing is to worship him, and that's going to be central to any society. And if God does not exist, then any claims to worship him are fraudulent, which means then the society is going to have to prohibit the worship of God. We have this illusion that we can somehow step back 
and kind of like we can ignore the question of God. But he says basically the problem of God is a problem that never goes away. We could also look at as we're going to is the idea is that once we stop worshiping God, we just go back to worshiping things much, much less worthy. Okay, religion then as God, but another way of considering God is good orderly direction. God is more than that, but Aquinas will actually talk about the idea that to be God is fundamentally to be provident. When people talk about God, they always think about something that is overseeing insurance, good orderly direction. So when we get rid of religion, we lose good orderly direction. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, he says theology is like a map. Of course, here we have the map of Narnia. It's hard to get to. Um, but if you want to get around, he says that in some ways, our religious experiences in a way are more important than theology. But he says, wait a second, remember, maps come from experiences of other people, lots of people, and often people that are better than you, wiser than you. So theology is a collection of all the religious experiences of other people. It's the religious experience of Moses, of Isaiah, Paul, Jesus, Mary, she treasured these things and kept them. That's what we get when we study theology. We get not just my own experience, but others. He also says a map is necessary to go anywhere. If you simply want to remain spiritual and relax and stop obsessing, that's wonderful. All of us would do better to take 10 minutes a day breathing, right? That would be probably good for all of us. But what about if we want to go somewhere? In a way, the doctrines of religion help us to figure out how to do that. Now, um, I want to highlight something that's a little bit more problematic, which is, what is our way? Have it your way. Um, I just give three examples here of kind of horrific things about human history. Um, in 2015, they discovered in the Aztec temples uh, that the they, Aztecs constructed the temple itself out of human skulls of those that they sacrificed. Uh, they would take all the sacrificed skulls, they would put a bar through them, I think through the temples, and then they would fill in with this. This is a scale of human sacrifice only, you know, 500, 600 years ago. The interesting thing is that um, this is what, uh, sorry, I forget, um, name of the explorer, Cortez. Cortez um, wrote that they were horrific human sacrifices, but basically the historians have always discounted that because they thought Cortez was just trying to you know, use it for propaganda purposes. But it turns out archeology span has proved it right. I'm not saying Cortez was necessarily on the side of the angels, I don't know. Um, but I do know that um, like, this, is a, this is what human beings do to each other from time to time. Right? There's a problem here. We look at the shoes of victims exterminated at Auschwitz, hills and hills of cheap shoes. They have hills and hills of pictures that you can see of glasses. The order and efficiency of Auschwitz is scary. Right? They used IBM machines to track because you couldn't keep track of the killings by just paper and pencil, right? Horrific scale. And remember that the Germans were the most advanced culture on the planet. All the most advanced universities, the advanced science, the advanced music, the best music, the best science came out of Germany. Uh, and then we also have here, right, uh, abortions, talking about, right, breaking apart a body of a human being inside a womb. This is, these are kind of our things. Um, now, you might say kind of like, well, I'm not, I'm certainly not Hitler. Um, I'm not performing an abortion. I'm not, you know, a German. Uh, so I'm safe from evil. Well, in Tolkien's work, it's interesting. He creates, he kind of recreates a world that imitates our world. And so when he creates the elves, well, how do you get the elves that are good, that are in dialogue with the Valar, in dialogue in a way with the, the Yuvatar, with God, 
how do they go bad? Well, Feanor the elf, um, who eventually ends up becoming the kinslayer, strangely like Cain, we never become sympathetic with Cain because we just think Cain's a jerk because we don't know him very long. But the story of Cain and Abel is meant to say we're Cain. That's what I do, and that's what Jesus says, is if you are mad at your brother, you're Cain. But anyway, so when uh, Tolkien does this, he gives two reasons why Feanor becomes this, he sows discord. First is he makes the Silmaril, which are beautiful, so beautiful, they have the light themselves of the created lights of the universe, and then the two trees that have it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, the imaging that, that are in the Silmarils. And because he's created them, he possesses them, and he won't give them up to the Valar. Our possessions possess us, and when they do, we begin to create, we separate from God. But that's not quite enough to explain the horror, right? How do you explain the horror? Well, it turns out there's an evil lord, an evil Valar, an evil dark prince, like our Satan, named Melkor, and Melkor at one point kills Finwë, Feanor's father. Right? How to avenge evil without becoming evil? Well, Feanor swears an oath that he will, and he has all his sons swear an oath. They end up renaming Melkor Morgoth. His assistant becomes Sauron, who is famous in the Lord of the Rings. But I want us just to pause on this when. Tolkien's trying to come up with the nature of evil. He goes to the idea of vengeance. Now, I just ask you for a moment, right? Think about what you might do or what people might do if, say, a loved one were harmed. And I mean harmed significantly by a person who had no respect for that person. You know, maybe a granddaughter was harmed by, you know, somebody and in just unspeakable ways. And you had the power to do whatever you wanted. What would you do? How would you set the scales of justice right? What kind of, what kind of tortures would not be appropriate? Right? You know, it's very hard to figure out how do we respond to evil. And I think we often forget that because we just tend to abstract ourselves from it. We think we're kind of safe and protected. But we can't. It's because evil is there that evil sends forth the discordant note. It gets into our hearts. And so we will perpetuate the cycle of evil. It's why even the law of the old covenant, when it says you will only take an eye for an eye, is an act of mercy and justice. Because if somebody takes an eye from my kid, I'm, I'm not just going to take an eye, right? If somebody, you see it in the Old Testament one time, sometimes like there, there's a, a rape of a sister, and they go and they kill, the, they slaughter the, all the men in the nearby village. That kind of seems almost appropriate. I mean, you know, it's like, I, what do you do? This is, I guess what I'm saying is we really have to put ourselves in this situation in which we, we have to give up the illusion, if only I had all the power in the world, I would, I would use it well. Um, so we get to this idea, have it your way. What is our way? Lewis in The Great Divorce says there are, in the end, two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. That's it. The question is, what is our will? C.S. Lewis in The Magician's Nephew writes this, length of days with an evil heart is only length of misery, and she begins to know it already. All get what they want. They do not always like it. One of the problems with the spiritual but not religious attitude is that it doesn't take seriously the problem of our will the problem of evil across human history. Chesterton would say that the original sin is the only doctrine that's empirically verifiable. 
In every age, people do it, but it's also strange. In our age, people do not believe it. I don't, you know, that having rejected the good news of the incarnation, they've rejected what the catechism calls the opposite side of original sin. They tend to believe that if only, you know, we could change the environment, we could start fresh and we could create a utopia on earth. I think it's somewhat hard to believe in God, that God is going to establish a utopia in heaven, but the fact that human beings and a government would establish a utopia on earth, like that definitely takes faith. Um, okay, so the first idea is that religion then becomes this good orderly direction and we have to get a way out of ourselves. Our egos, right, edge God out of the picture. We, in a certain sense, edged everyone out of the picture. We see the world through our own elements. Um, and you can think as simply as like, you know, stub your toe. Your sto tub, I mean, sorry, when you stub your toe, it really hurts. It hurts a lot. And when other people stub their toe, it, yeah, it kind of hurts. Like I'm aware they stub their toe, I'm sorry for them. But when I stub my toe, it's like my whole world is filled with my pain. Right? I'm sorry for others when they experience loss, absolutely. But it doesn't fill my soul in the same way that my loss does, unless somehow they're connected to me and I receive it as my own. So my ego tends to edge God, edge reality out of the picture. Just as a little uh, anecdote, I have a student who is a youth minister in, um, in an area in Florida, and one of her favorite lines was a line I don't even remember saying as a teacher, which is always kind of interesting. The things you work so hard at aren't remembered, and the things that you forget about are the things that make a difference. Um, but she just said one time, I was, we were talking about something, and I said this, um, you know, mass isn't about you, mass is about God, you know? And it's like, well, but, but th like that's why we tend to think, well, I'm not getting anything out of mass or again, well, because we want mass to be about us, right? And if you've ever sat through a bad homily or you've ever sat through kind of peculiar architecture or peculiar following of rubrics, just remember Jesus has sat through more bad homilies than you have, right? Jesus has been present in more bad architecturally designed churches in the tabernacle than you have. He's been present at more questionably, you know, so just kind of like, just be grateful. But, but you know, like we, we have to remember this is not about us. And, uh, and always be grateful that we have the creed at every mass so we know, we know the full faith is confessed. Um, so I want to begin then to think kind of like not only because of this ego, we end up with a false image of God. Rather than us, recognizing who God is and therefore becoming like him in uh, Jeff Caven's beautiful way of talking about how God is holy, so we should be holy. God, how does God act? We should imitate him. We do the exact opposite. We who become unholy, who become prideful, envious, gluttonous, devouring, we become fearful, turned in on ourselves. We then think about God in our image. Freud wasn't totally wrong when he said religion is, not a, is basically man creating God in his own image. Freud was wrong in saying that's all it is, and it's always that. But it is often the case that that's what human beings do. Human beings that are wicked and cruel, perhaps a culture that's wicked and cruel, will create a God that is wicked and cruel. Scripture portrays the tragic consequences of this first disobedience, original sin. Adam and Eve immediately lose the grace of original holiness. And we, it's not so much that then they become bad, it's that they become blind. They no longer see the dignity of each other and they no longer see the glory of God. They become afraid of the God of whom they have conceived a distorted image, that of a God jealous of his prerogatives. We no longer think God is trustworthy. That's why Adam and Eve don't immediately repent, throw themselves at the mercy of God. They lie. The serpent, or you know, they, the serpent whom you know tricked me, the woman you gave me, right? She, you know, they don't even take responsibility. So 
fundamentally, what's at the heart in a way of we have false images of God? Uh, so wisdom and discovering God. I want to talk a little bit about the book of wisdom as kind of a key insight here. And if we go to wisdom 3, 5, it says this, from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. So even though we have a false image of God because of our distorted wills, we still should be able to reason from the beauty of created things to uh, the beauty of the creator. You may be familiar also in Romans 1.20. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the light in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. We could come to know that God exists and is the creator and is good and wise, but we don't. We don't recognize what is due him. <sighs> Pardon me. And so here when we get to the order and disorder, we kind of see the universe, the physical universe, and again, we just want to step back and say, wait a second, there is an intelligible order in the physical universe that's non-material. Because I can think about the entire universe, but in a strange way, the universe is not thinking about me. I can think about stars that are you know, millions of light years away, but those stars are not thinking about me. So there's not only order in the universe, but there is my capacity to understand the order of the universe. This shows in a way that God must be a mind. He must be intelligence. Einstein would come up with that idea where he said the most unintelligible thing about the universe is that it is intelligible. And he would say, therefore, there has to be a mind behind the universe. Psalm 19 summarizes it very easily. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament declares his handiwork. Now, another way is to think then about the moral order of the universe. Nietzsche says this, as long as there is grammar, then God is not fully dead. By the way, this could be a bad sign for our culture as grammar is quickly going out the window. Um, and uh, anyway, so we may be finally excising God's remembrance from our culture. Um, but Aquinas, when he comments on Aristotle's politics, you don't, we don't need to go through all this, but I think at the principles in his he says animals yell at each other to express emotions of anger, fear, desire. But human beings have words, they speak in order to reference things. And so here he says, we have language, we communicate with one another regarding the just and the unjust, the useful and the harmful. Human beings naturally talk. As soon as kids start talking, they start talking about that's not fair, right? We, we don't introduce that to them. They intuitively have a moral order that's revealed through language. And it's interesting, He'll go on to then say, that's why man is naturally a domestic and a political animal. He naturally doesn't live alone, but he lives in families and in communities. It's not the Lockean individual. And this is what language, so language itself is revelatory of a moral order. It's interesting, and if you've ever read uh, The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, the animals that speak aren't just kind of like, they don't have artificial intelligence, they have moral intelligence. Now, wisdom, though, says that this is not only that we can come to know the truth about God, but that we also fall into idolatry. All men who were ignorant of God were foolish by nature. They were unable from the good things that are seen to know him who exists, nor did they recognize the craftsman while paying heed to his works. It's very interesting because this is very much like our age. Uh, Stephen Barr, who is a Catholic physicist and writes a lot on theology and science, says we are so good, especially in modern physics, at looking what is in front of our eyes that we forget what, what is behind our eyes, right? We are so focused on looking at the world, we forget that we are looking at the world and that we come from something that is not in the world and that we come from a craftsman, right, who made us. And then Wisdom 14, 27 says this, 
The worship of idols is the beginning and cause of every evil. I'll just get it all up there. Oops, I got to go back. Okay, there it is. Um, of course, you may know 1 Timothy 6 says the love of money is the root of all evils. And I think Paul is right. But I think somehow if you go back to wisdom, it's even more powerful. The worship of idols is the beginning and cause and aim of every evil. Well, what does it mean to talk about the worship of idols? And so I want to put before you kind of a little bit of an image, maybe even share a little bit of my own story. Uh, and I have permission, by the way, from my loved ones to share some of the story. But we got to think idols are not, I don't know how to put it, it's not like sticking a snake up on a wall and then all falling down and worshiping or putting a golden calf up here and worshiping it. We worship idols because they do one of two things. They protect us from what we fear or they promise to give us what we want. So they fulfill our desires and they safeguard us from fear. And I would just ask you to think a little bit about that. I don't know how many people in this room would raise their hands if I said, you know, like if you could put your hand into a machine and it would give your body every physical pleasure that you could have, would you really want to do it? You know, you know. But what if I could put something, you could put your hand into a machine um, and it would, like if ever you died, you could die without pain. You know, the fear of pain, the fear of dying is a much more motivating factor than the desire for pleasure. Aquinas will say actually that we need the virtue of courage more than the virtue of temperance because fear of suffering and death turns us away from God more than the desire for pleasure. And we know how much the desire for pleasure turns us away from God. Um, so when we get to C.S. Lewis, um, he, in his Weight of Glory, this is a sermon where he talks about, he has this quote where he says, um, uh, he says, like, basically, God does not find our desires too large but too small. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with sex, money, and ambition when infinite joy is offered, like an ignorant child playing in the mud in the slums who doesn't understand the offer of a vacation at sea, right? We are far too easily pleased. We want earthly glories that we focus on and we forget divine glory that's promised to us. And what he mentions are these three things. He says, the problem is the good things of this earth, when they are mistaken for the thing itself, God, they turn into dumb idols breaking the hearts of their worshipers. It could be music, it could be nostalgia, it could be that memory of the perfect family, it could be that desire for the perfect family. And he says, he actually at one point says, do you think I'm trying to weave a spell? Perhaps I am, but remember your fairy tales. Spells are used for breaking enchantments as well as for inducing them. And you and I have need of the greatest or strongest spell that can be found to wake us from the evil enchantment of worldliness which has been laid upon us for almost a hundred years. Almost our whole education has been directed to silencing the shy, inner, persistent voice. Almost all our modern philosophies have been devised to convince us that the good of man is to be found on this earth. So what's the enchantment of worldliness? It's that the good of man is to be found on earth. Now these are real goods. Could be the good of curing cancer, I don't know, you know, all these different elements. So let's, um, let's go on a little bit to try to explore this idea. And I want to suggest the beauty of created things. Wisdom 13.3 says, If through delight of the beauty of created things, men assumed them to be gods, let them know how much better than these is the Lord, for the author of beauty created them. So I include uh, my own picture since I have permission. And um, this is uh, one of my granddaughters, six-month-old, Lily and Grace. Um, right? I don't really want to worship a golden calf, but it's pretty easy to worship your grandkids. Um, right? And maybe to worship yourself and trying to help them and help your kids help them and all these different elements. So I think when we think about idols, we got to think about things we actually like. Find those things you like. 
Find those things of which you are afraid. Find those things of which you resent. And those might be your idols. Not saying we shouldn't love our grandkids, okay? Right? Um, but we just got to take them in elements. So the beauty of created things. But again, I think that's what makes, the, that's what makes them I, capable of being idolatrous. And part of the whole reason why we're doing this is we want to remember is that we are trapped in false religions. That's why we need the new religion of Jesus. We're trapped in false spiritualities. That's why we need it. So we need to diagnose false religion and false spiritualities. So just a quick thing here. Here's a, a picture of, this is uh, my wife and I when we were first married with our first two kids. Um, you know, like we're trying to do things for good. We're trying to do things for Jesus. Um, so, but we're also building a family. Well, it's complicated. Right? Are your children yours or are they God's? Well, both. Um, but there's also a way, and you can begin to think about, and at least I feel like I began to think at certain times as though my family was my family. It was my job to ensure that my children turn out well, that my children practice the faith, that my children obey the commandments, that my children don't end up like other people's children. Right? That doesn't seem that hard. Um, it's, and it's like 80% of your real job. But you learn out it's actually not your whole job. Your job is not to make sure that your children don't get sick or don't get cancer or don't get depression or don't struggle with drugs and alcohol or don't get divorced. Those are not your job. We are not in charge of the results and outcomes of life. But you can easily fall into the trap of feeling like it. And this is just my own story. So I think a, a priest might tell a story of falling into wanting to like become responsible for the parish. You know, a sister might feel responsible for the monastery, right? A single person might feel responsible for the youth ministry or, or whatever it is. Um, but we have to recognize that can also become an idol. It can become a pro projection of my ego. I used to think when I was younger that when things got bad and, you know, we had five miscarriages and my wife was sick for many years, I used to think that I would put my family on my back and I would carry them. And that's so close to the truth. But it's also so delusional. You know, I can wear this sport coat very nicely, but it's not a cape. I am not Superman. And I had to, at a certain point, take off my cape you know, and if ever any of you have ever felt like you felt like you wish you had a cape or should have had a cape or were ashamed because you weren't able to kind of save everyone else around you, you know, that shame comes from the devil that accuses us. Satan is the great accuser and the Holy Spirit is the great advocate. Um, so, and here's a picture of my um, son and I have permission to share this story. Uh, this is my wife, and um, you know, he, he over the last five years he had multiple suicide attempts. He struggled with depression. He struggled with drugs and alcohol. For today, praise God, he's alive and sober. It's two, two years, um, but you know, I went through things that I had no idea, and I know at first I felt responsible, but now I look back and I realize that was this that was the religion of my ego. That was the religion of my ego because I can never raise, I can't raise people from the dead. I can't raise people from depression. I can't raise people. I just can't raise people. What I can do is I can love them and I can accept them. And I can also, you know, you can have healthy boundaries and all these other different elements. That's, uh, that's another talk. Um, but I just want to say that sometimes the idols where they, we, we like it's the, the thorns of the cares of this life and the anxiety over rich, rich, riches Usually that's not getting the Ferrari, but it might be, how do I like leave a legacy for my kids, right? Um, how do I deal with whether or not my kids go to mass? Can I still be happy at mass if my kids are not there? Well, I, I better be able to say yes. I better be able to say I can love Jesus and rejoice in Jesus whether or not my loved ones love him. Aquinas does say, by the way, at one point where he says, moderate sorrow is the mark of a conditioned mind. So being a little bit sorrowful at the evils of this world, my own and yours and others is, is also appropriate, but we have to find a way to have joy. So 
Again, I want to set up this ideals, idols as desiring goods and fearing evils. And a lot of us are focusing on earthly goods, earthly peace, consumerism and debt, material comfort and gratification, sexual freedom, sexual exploitation, bodily pleasure and domination, bodily health and euthanasia, extended life without pain and suffering. It's interesting, you know, right now we have a pandemic of suicidality among young people and old people. And we also, of course, have a rise in euthanasia, both among old people and younger people. Yeah. This, is a, this is a large element. Addictions, manufactured spiritual experiences, numbing pain, family, we can view our children as possessions. Worldly success, trying to cure cancer. By the way, a beautiful prayer that a friend of mine taught me was, Lord, before they were mine, they were yours, and I put them back in your hands. And I think you can say that for children, grandchildren, but also for friends, parents, for, for everyone. So Christianity then becomes a way out of idolatry. That's the key point. That's what we need. Uh, J.K. Chesterton in The Everlasting Man describes the creed as a key. And I want to mention the three things that a key does. It has a definite and hard shape. If it's amorphous, it doesn't open the key. If it gets worn down, it's not going to open the door. It has an arbitrary, historically given shape, a shape that could not be deduced from reason. Sometimes when I teach this to students, they get annoyed that I say it's arbitrary. But what I mean by that is we couldn't reason our way to the crucifixion. We have to reason from the crucifixion. We couldn't reason our way to the incarnation. We reason from it. You couldn't reason your way to the Mass, you reason from it. Uh, even in our creed, we say weird things like suffered under Pontius Pilate. Well, it's kind of arbitrary that he was working that day, right? I mean, but, but that's, we accept it. But the key thing about a key is that it opens a door. And Chesterton says it matters what kind, where you think you are. If you're in a prison and somebody offers you a key, you're excited, right? But if you think you're home and somebody offers you a key, you don't care. And in a way, that's the modern world, is we think that the good of man is to be found in this world. So we have no desire to go anywhere else. And I want to suggest that the easiest creed is simply Jesus is Lord. It's in 1 Corinthians, Romans 10, and Philippians 2. Jesus is Lord. And when I say Jesus is Lord... I am rejecting the claim of the Romans that Caesar is Lord, which was said at that time, and I am rejecting my own claim to being Lord myself. It's a surrender of pride because I am admitting that I am not Lord. None of us, of course, probably run around thinking we're God, but we do run around kind of probably criticizing the world and giving God a lot of comments for how he could be running the world better. Right? It's like it's one of the jobs from which I had to um, resign was you know, trying to run the universe. Uh, it's partly why Jesus says, right, my yoke is easy. I'm going to show this in a minute. My burden is light. It's because our yoke is heavy when we put the weight of the world on our shoulders. But Jesus doesn't even carry his own weight. He just carries the weight from the Father. And so we then carry his weight and we can become freed. Okay, so true religion then is the way back to God. Religion is part of the virtue of justice, the settled and reliable disposition by which we give to each his due with our heads and our hearts. Right? Justice is when you get extra money at the cash register, you give it back because it's not yours. It's not even really hard. It's settled and reliable. Um, but what do we owe God? And I think we can think about three things, honor, right? Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto your name, give it be the glory. Right? Just that simple. Either I'm the center of my honor and glory, or God is. Contrition. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Against you, you alone have I sinned. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not spurn. And then thanksgiving. Chester would actually say that it's um, uh, thanks, gratitude, basically, is uh, the kind of key to the Christian life. And gratitude, by the way, in Greek is Eucharistos, right? The Eucharist, Thanksgiving. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of Thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. We can't thank God if we don't think he rescued us from a prison, 
And ultimately what I realized is the prison from which he rescued me was my own delusional ego. Yes, also from the devil, yes, also from the culture, but specifically from my own ego. Now, I wanna suggest in this next part, so that's the first part, is really focusing on kind of idolatry and the way we get trapped in false religions. Now I wanna look at how God reveals to us his true face, and he reveals that his greatest attribute is mercy. St. John Fisher, who was martyred along with John, uh, with Thomas More, wrote this. God has shown to us Christian people the treasures of his great mercy, the secret mysteries of the faith and the sacraments of health by which we may trust indeed to have forgiveness. We have lived so long in a Christian, post-Christian world that we think the universe will forgive us. That, I mean, the universe is a wonderful place and we ought to have a sense of awe and wonder and we ought to try to live in accord with the universe, but the universe is not a very forgiving place. You screw up in nature and you die, right? That's just it. Like nature is actually a pretty dangerous place. If you live in Florida, you have more of a sense of that because there's in any, if the body of water is more than 15 feet across, there's a gator in it. Um, so that's what Jesus does is he, we discover God's great mercy and the faith and sacraments of the church, the religion of the church allows us to get forgiveness. What do I want in my deepest spirituality to have peace? How do I find it? Through religion, but not through any religion, through the religion of Christianity. So when we think about God unveiling his true face, I wanna, I'm gonna just go ahead and put all these out for us. Revelation is an unveiling, an apocalypsis. Now, in Hosea, he goes to, and you may know the story of Hosea. Um, he, uh, Hosea has to marry a prostitute, so he knows what it's like to be God and be married to an adulterous, uh, you know, people. Um, but even with that, after his wife is, like, she's a prostitute who goes back to being a prostitute, he says, in that day, call her back. And she says, Hosea says, in that day, says the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer will you call me my Baal. Now Baal is both the one of the gods they worshiped and it's also the term that was used for husbands in the Middle East, in, in the ancient Near East. Uh, they were Baals and that's why you worship them because you worshiped kind of the sign of like we worship Dwayne the Rock Johnson or something. You know, like you worship the archetypal male who is strong and fertile. So you are but in, we forget that the revelation of Genesis is the idea that man and woman shall become one. There's a reciprocity between man and woman. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. There's a fundamental equality between man and woman. The woman is not, um, you know, is, is not another property in the way, but there's a covenantal relationship. So God says, I will not be your master, your Baal, I will be your husband. I will enter the covenant with you that I revealed to you in Genesis 1 and 2 between Adam and Eve. Isaiah 54, your maker is your husband, for the Lord has called you like a wife, forsaken and grieved in spirit. Hosea 2.14 says, God will speak tenderly to us. God will take us, it's like you're going to go on a marriage retreat where um, your mean husband's gonna take you and speak tenderly to you, but it's actually not your husband's fault. You've been an awful spouse, right? You know, that's what God says to us. So this is, he's letting us know he's a loving, forgiving husband. We're broken, but he wants to take us into the wilderness and speak tenderly to us. That's his true face. So I want to look at Moses. How do we discover the face of mercy? It's actually interesting. This was, um, I'm going to put it all up here because Scott mentioned this as well. Exodus 34. Moses says, I want to see your face. He says, you can't see my face and live. But he passes him by. It's interesting. That same word passing by is what Jesus does in the, when he walks on the water and he was going to pass them by. He was going to show him that he was God. But this is what he says when he passed by, and this is right in the heart of the Exodus, the heart of the Old Testament. This is why we are not Marcians. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New. 
I am a Lord, grace, God, grace, sorry, God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Steadfast love is hesed, elios in the Greek, merciful. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That, who is God? God is merciful and gracious, abounding. How many? He's just like, there are 10 of them phrases put together. That's who God is. But it will by no means clear the guilty. So doesn't God's also just. God's not just going to say, ah, it's all fine. Don't worry about it. You can be, you know, you can go to heaven and be awful. No, justice matters. Uh, how do we see this in Isaiah? He says this in Isaiah 55, Seek the Lord where he may be found. Call on him where he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Again, who is God? God is the one who will have mercy. Let's look at the next part. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. We can reason to God's order. We can reason to God's intelligence. We can reason to God's justice. We cannot reason to God's mercy. It is above us. It is only there by revelation, right? For as the snow and the rain come down from the heavens, my word shall goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. Right? When God sends his word into the world, it will accomplish the mercy that he is promising. So this is one of the biggest problems with the kind of spiritual but not religious position is that we need a God of mercy, but we only get mercy through religion. We only get mercy through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you'll notice as our culture becomes increasingly post-Christian, it becomes increasingly less merciful. If you did something wrong, you get canceled. If you did something wrong 30 years ago, you get canceled. There's no forgiveness anymore. They might, it might, you might not sin. They might say, well, that's not a sin. But if it is a sin, watch out. Right? Because mercy is a Christian Thing, begun, promised in the Old Testament. So this is just Psalm 103, beautiful psalm. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Again, 103.8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Sometimes people say, what's the name of God in the Old Testament? Well, yes, it's I am. Yes, it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it's also the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. That's his name. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great. So again, as a father pities his children, this is what's promised and revealed. Now, when God comes to dwell in the temple, he tells Solomon, and Solomon prays, prays this prayer in uh, both 1 Kings and in uh, 2 Chronicles. Basically, God can't dwell on earth. The heavens and the highest heaven can't contain thee. How much less than this house? But nonetheless, my name will be in this house. My name is in this house. So religion can hold the name of God, even though God transcends the world. And then notice what, um, what comes up further in this. Um, what does, what's promised in 2 Chronicles and in 1, 1 Kings 8? If they repent with all their mind, with all their heart, in the land of their captivity, and pray towards the land which you gave them, and to the house in which I build my name, then hear from your heaven, dwell, your dwelling place, their prayer and their pleas, and forgive your people who have sinned against you. What's the point of God dwelling in the temple? So he may forgive us. So we may know the name to call upon him. That's the purpose of the Old Testament, is so we may know the name of God who dwells in the temple and so find forgiveness. So then in Jesus Christ, we have um, uh, in Matthew, I'm not gonna go through all this, but the basic idea, he says that I, you thank you, Father, Lord of heaven, you've revealed this. What was revealed? That no one knows the Son except the Father and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. 
The fundamental revelation of the New Testament is the revelation of Jesus as the Son and of God as the Father. So from the Old Testament, we discover that God is merciful. In the New Testament, we discover that God is merciful by being Father and by being Son. His eternal love of the Holy Trinity, right? We can never come by reason to do that. I think a lot of people will say, oh, you can't reason to the Trinity, but they don't realize you can't reason to the mercy, right? Mercy has to be revealed, and so does the Trinity. Um, Again, when Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? Well, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Flesh and blood cannot reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So when God reveals himself as Father, he is revealing the way in which he will go about bringing about the mercy that he promised in the Old Testament through the mission of his Son. And then so through Jesus Christ, we then have access in one spirit through the Father. So there's the revelation of the Trinity. Um, we also talk about the idea that in First, Second Peter 1, 4, we become sharers in the divine nature. We even have um, Galatians where we become children of God. But I want to move ahead a little bit um, to this question about, then again, so now if, Jesus is the Son that is revealed. Who is he? And here's a beautiful little, this is from the uh, catacomb in Rome, the th around the third century. And it's an image of Jesus, the shepherd, carrying the sheep. Jesus is the shepherd, by the way. Yes, Peter is the shepherd. Yes, the bishops are the shepherd. But it's always Christ who is shepherding us. Uh, and we have this in John 1, or John 10, right? I am the door. I am the good shepherd. Pope Benedict in Space Alvi will say that Jesus is the best shepherd because if you remember from Psalm 23 where we say the Lord is my shepherd, we say, right, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Well, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death now, I know that Jesus is shepherding me through it because he walked through the valley of the shadow of death as shally, shadow of death as well. So then, Jesus is unique because he is the door and the shepherd. He is the Lord. So if we go here, we go to something new about Jesus. We have new religion, new spirituality. The image on uh, the icon up on top is of Jesus as the eternal word measuring out creation. He is the creator. The creative word, the word through whom all things are created, and then the other one is the word that becomes incarnate. It's interesting in this little icon, the Pantra Kachor, half of Jesus' face is perfect and looks divine, and the other half looks kind of human and a little bit crooked. It's kind of interesting trying to show the two sides of Jesus' face. But if you go to Isaiah 43, behold, I am doing a new thing. Something new is happening in Jesus. We have a new religion, a new spirituality. In Acts 4, 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we may be saved. Remember the importance of the name that dwelt in the temple. Well, now we have the name that dwells in the New Testament temple, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ becomes the true name. So, it is true, if any other human name tries to claim to be God, we would say that's not true. It's only kind of pointing at God. But now we have a name that truly is God. Romans 8, 1, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in you. So Jesus' name is a new religion, and now we have a new spirituality because we have the spirit that dwells in us. So what I want to suggest in a way that... We don't, the, Jesus does not establish another religion or another spirituality. We have a new religion and a new spirituality. All other, as Fulton Sheen would say, are man's search for God, but only in Christianity and in, for, or earlier in Judaism do we have God's search for man. So without Christ, there's no Catholicism, but also without Catholicism, there's no Christ. Um, C.S. Lewis in The Last Battle says that the inside is bigger than the outside. Right? Inside Catholicism is the whole universe. Right? Inside Christ is the creator. That's the mystery. Um, Ignatius of Antioch, by the way, 
Um, he's the first one to call the church Catholic. And he says, right, wherever the bishop is and wherever the Eucharist is, there is the Catholic church. And let's remember, that means the universal church. So now we have a religion that's not particular. We have a religion that's universal. It's never been seen before. It's also interesting, and it's in the same Antioch, which is where the Christians are, where they're first called Christians. So the first place they're called Christians is also the first place they're called Catholics. So in, in closing, um, I just want to highlight a couple of key themes um, kind of quickly because I'm running a little bit out of time. But what I want to suggest is that Carl Adam in his Spirit of Catholicism says that basically the idea is that there's no religionless Christianity. From the very beginning in Second Temple Judaism, you have religion. Jesus, you have religion. The early, early Catholics, you have religion. You always have religion. And that means you have dogmatic specifications, moral specifications, liturgical. Right? No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. When God is adjoined, let no man run asunder. What I received, I handed on to you that on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. How to worship, how to believe, how to live. This is what Christianity tells us to do. But Christ then becomes the center of that. Because if Christ is the true center, true self of the church, it also means that the dogma of the church will make no sense if we don't see it as Christ reaching us through the dogma. The morals and the liturgy of the church only have their definitive meaning and life-giving because Christ comes to us through there. Um, so Aquinas, by the way, will describe this through the language of the new law. Um, and I want to just highlight this idea that he says that the new law, which is the law of the new covenant, is first, and he's the, Christ is the teacher of the new law. The new law is from Romans 8, the law of the spirit of life, law, lex, covenant, all these elements. But first, it is primarily the grace of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. It's unwritten. And in that sense, I want to say there, Christ perfects all human spirituality. You want spirituality? Have the Holy Spirit dwell in your hearts. That's bigger than any religion, so to speak. But Aquinas also says it's not only the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts, it's also the instructions on how to receive and use this grace. Written, scriptures, creeds, sacraments, and the moral life. So Aquinas shows us how to be spiritual and religious because both are in Christ. Christ sends the Holy Spirit into our hearts, and he also directs us on how to receive that grace, live in it, and stay in it. Um, I wanted to highlight just uh, uh, briefly um, the notion how mercy changes vengeance. I mentioned the bad elves, Feanor, who by this love of trying to avenge his father creates discord on Middle Earth. Well, it's interesting that at one time Frodo says it's a pity Bilbo didn't kill Gollum when he had the chance. Gandalf says this, pity? It's a pity that, it's pity that stayed Bilbo's hand. Many that live deserve death. Some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them, Frodo? Do not be too eager to deal out death in judgment. Even the very wise cannot see all ends. My heart tells me that Gollum has some part to play in it for good or evil before this is over. The pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many. If you know the story, eventually Frodo gets to the edge and can't throw the ring in. But Gollum actually bites off his finger and falls in and puts it in. Bilbo eventually shows pity. Frodo shows pity. And even Samwise towards the end shows pity. Uh, so this pity that begins in Christ, that is revealed in Christ, shapes the way we then act towards others and to ourselves. I want to um, close with this last, we'll see if I can do this. I'm a little bit over time, but I think they'll let me. Uh, so I want to look at seeking the God of mercy. We want to see God's face. I want you to think for a moment to pray Psalm 42 like a Jew, without the Messiah coming. We long for flowing streams, so my soul longs for thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, I shall again praise him. There's a deep sense of longing for God, of wanting to see the face of God, but knowing that we don't, but we will hope, but it's long and it's tired. 
So I want to then consider how we can pray that same psalm in the New Testament. Finding, not seeking the God of mercy, but having found him. So I want to suggest in a way that Christ frees us from being trapped within the idolatry of the worship of the good things of this world and the worship of our own ego. In Christ and the religion that Christ establishes, he reveals God as mercy, and Christ perfects that mercy. He perfects spirituality and religion by carrying it out. And the joy that we can experience by having seen the face of God in Jesus Christ, the joy of that music, right, of Palestrina, that's the deepest spirituality that we can have when we enter into the religion that's established by Jesus Christ, by which he alone offers to God what is due him, which is infinite charity, and so seeks to replicate it in us. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank you all for being attentive, and I'd be happy to chat with you afterwards. Thank you very much.